Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Two women, both named Mary Morris, are murdered three days apart in the same town. Was it a coincidence or is there a connection? Liz Carmichael claims that her revolutionary three-wheeled car gets 60 miles to the gallon, but she and the car are not what they appear to be. In South Carolina, a volunteer officer is gunned down during a robbery. His killer has escaped from prison. And in Florida, suspicious fires ravage nearly 30 churches in just over a year. A serial arsonist may be at work. Join us for five cases with twists and turns that you can hardly believe. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Houston, Texas. In a remote area outside the city, a passerby makes a gruesome discovery. Inside a smoldering car, he finds a body burned beyond recognition. The CSI unit is called and begins searching the area for clues. The car belongs to 48-year-old Mary Morris, who lives only three miles away. Her husband, has not been able to reach her since she left for work early that morning. I called a supervisor and found out she wasn't at work. That's when I knew immediately that there was something wrong because she didn't miss work. Within a few hours, detectives deliver the terrible news. The victim in the car is Mary Morris. The condition of the body makes it impossible to determine how she was killed nor can police determine the motive. Mary was a bank loan officer with many friends, a successful career, and no known enemies. There was no reason for it whatsoever. She was just a really a good person, you know, never did anything bad to anybody. They asked everything from gambling to drugs to affairs to anything, and all the answers were no. Just three days after the death of Mary Morris, this case took on a very strange turn. Not far from where Mary's body was found, another woman was viciously murdered. She too was killed in her car, and she too was named Mary Morris. Two women named Mary Morris, both found murdered in their cars, both in the Houston area, and just three days apart, and both had similar physical descriptions. Coincidence? In order to find a possible link, detectives tried to piece together the events leading up to the death of the second victim. Mary McGinnis Morris was 39 years old, and like Mary Lou Morris, she was a successful professional with a lot of friends. Mary was like an angel. She was very joyful, always happy, making people laugh. Not enough words really to describe her. I mean, she was just really loved by everybody. I'll call you in the morning. Mary okay. Lou Morris was a nurse practitioner in charge of several clinics for a major industrial corporation. Anything basically a doctor would do, Mary did. She would work 14 hours a day, not think twice, go back in of an evening, weekends, whenever she was needed. Mary got along well with everyone on her staff, except for one new employee, a male nurse. She told me that she was afraid of this person that she worked with, and I said, do you really think he could hurt you? And she said, yes, I do, and I think he could do worse. Soon after that conversation, Mary stopped by her office one evening to pick up some papers, and she became frightened by what she found there. She found things out of place on her desk, pictures turned to face the wrong direction. On his desk was written the words death to her, which she assumed was written about her. 
she made a phone call to me on her way home, and uh, she, I could tell that she was that she was shaken. I think this whole thing is really out of control. She got home and she asked me if I would provide her with a gun to carry with her for her own protection. She asked me to go over the, the handling and use of the gun. When we were finished, she asked me to place the gun in her car under the driver's seat. A few weekends later, Mary met her friend, Laurie Gemmel, at the clinic to get a flu shot. Mary seemed fine that Sunday, and she was only going to stay a couple of hours, and then she was going to go home. Laurie says that she later received a call from Mary, who sounded panicked. Hi, it's me. When she was in the drugstore, she saw somebody that gave her the creeps. She said, I'm just going to run across the bridge and turn off my computer and sign out of the building and, and go home. Twelve minutes after saying goodbye to Lori, Mary McGinnis Morris made a frantic call to 911. We're not releasing the content of the tape. It covers the attack that happened to Mary. And anybody that's ever heard that tape has uh, just had their blood chilled listening to it. It's, it's a very chilling, disturbing call. The medical examiner's report revealed that Mary was viciously beaten and then shot in the head. Investigators focused on Mary's co-worker at the clinic. He had quit his job after allegedly trying to discredit Mary. Detectives claim to have evidence linking him to the crime, and he remains a suspect. However, when investigators tried to question Mary's husband, Mike Morris, his behavior aroused suspicion. He wouldn't meet with us without an attorney. Witnesses don't need attorneys. Suspects generally have attorneys. Mike Morris says that he was only following the advice of some trusted friends. Several people suggested that I take an attorney with me, not because I had anything to hide, but just to have somebody with me that was familiar with the procedures. Next, detectives asked Mike Morris to take a polygraph test. He refused. I was on anti-anxiety medications. I was on antidepressants. I wasn't really sure that, that this polygraph examination that they were talking about could adequately compensate for all of those conditions. Authorities had also learned that Mike and Mary Morris were having serious problems with their marriage. When Mike heard of rumors of an alleged affair between Mary and a family friend, he confronted them head on. I can tell you that at the time that that happened, they both looked me in the eye and they both told me that, that there had been nothing inappropriate in their relationship. And I didn't see any betrayal in their eyes. And then there was the question of motive. Mary had a life insurance policy that would pay out $700,000. There was a large amount of life insurance on Mary Morris, which Mike Morris was the beneficiary too. There were a lot of reasons right there for, uh, in the way of a motive for Mike. But to the police, the most curious evidence against Mike Morris is a phone call he made to Mary's cell phone two hours after detectives believed that she was murdered. This phone call lasted for four minutes. This was, by all indications of the cellular telephone company, a completed call. What you have to wonder is, what did that phone call either set in motion or uh, end? Normally, um, the, the cellular service would have kicked in and, and said that the, uh, that the party you were calling was unavailable. Uh, I didn't get that. I don't know why I didn't get that. But as long as the phone was ringing and I thought that there was a possibility that she would answer it, I let it ring. But that raised yet another question. Detectives wondered why the call showed up on Mary's cell phone bill if no one answered. I don't accept that Mike made this phone call and that the phone rang for four minutes. It's not possible. The, the question is, who answered the phone on the other end? That's what the big question is. And what did they talk about for the four minutes? 
but Mike Morris firmly denies any involvement in Mary's death. I had absolutely nothing to do with the arrangement of Mary's murder. It's a hurtful insinuation. It's, it's absolutely untrue. The question remains today, why were Mary McGinnis Morris and Mary Lou Morris murdered, and who killed them? Some think that a contract killer was hired to murder the second Mary Morris and killed the first Mary Morris by mistake. That theory is supported by a call allegedly made to a Houston newspaper. A call came into the Houston Chronicle, and I verified this with somebody at the Chronicle. Between the time the first Mary Morris was killed and the time my friend was killed, saying something to the effect that they got the wrong Mary Morris the first time. The hit gone wrong theory is also supported by the fact that the wedding ring of the first Mary Morris was missing from the crime scene. If someone had put a hit out on a person, that's what they take back to show that they actually killed that person. Detectives also looked at the possibility that the two murders were, in fact, connected. As well with the remoteness of the location where the uh, victim was found, as well as the effort that was taken to destroy the evidence and, and the vehicle, um, that would be consistent you know, with a you know, contract killing. But with the background of the victim, uh, that doesn't seem likely. The first Mary Morris was a, was a mistake. Uh, it was a missed hit, a, a botched hit, something like that. There's not anything uh, that we found that would uh, support that. Detectives continued to search for any clues that might connect the two Mary Morrises, but came up empty. They later concluded that the murders were a bizarre coincidence. However, the family and friends of both Marys think that's impossible. The astronomical odds that two Mary Morses was killed three days apart, very similar in looks. To me, it's, that's what it is, an astronomical effort not connected. I can't help but think they have to be related. I can't imagine that two women with the same name would be murdered within three days of each other, both found in their cars, and not have that be related. According to police, both the co-worker of Mary McGinnis Morris and her husband, Mike Morris, have not been ruled out as suspects. If you have any information about her death or the death of Mary Lou Morris, please log on to unsolved.com. Next, meet the woman who pulled off one of the most amazing frauds we've ever encountered. In 1973, America faced an oil crisis that nearly crippled the country. Consumers wanted cheaper gas or more fuel-efficient cars. One visionary claimed that she had the perfect solution, a revolutionary three-wheeled vehicle called the Dale. This car supposedly cost less than $2,000 and got 60 miles to the gallon. Its creator claimed it could withstand an impact against a brick wall at 50 miles an hour. It seemed like the perfect answer to the gas crunch. We all heard of the gas guzzlers coming from Detroit, and here somebody could put out an automobile that could uh, get 60 miles to a gallon of gas and travel all over the city uh, without a problem uh, would have been the ideal automobile. We have pledges from private individuals for private stock the entrepreneur who unveiled the new car was a remarkable and forceful woman named Liz Carmichael. She had the ability to incite this fire in you. She's a very dynamic, strong person, and uh, she did things that, that uh, impressed us. A low-cost, high-mileage car was the right idea at the right time. Liz Carmichael pulled in more than $3 million worth of advanced sales. And this was before a single car rolled off the production line. Encino, California. In 1974, Liz Carmichael transformed herself from a housewife with five children to an entrepreneur. She established 20th Century Motor Car Corporation to produce her new three-wheeled car. 
called you all together to try and give you some update information on what we're doing here at 20th Century Motors and with the Dale. Liz told investors and the press that her company was renting three huge aircraft hangars where they would soon start production. And what about the cost? Cost factor, any American can afford our car. And the questions that were asked were not, well, if you've got a uh, manufacturing facility, where is it? And how long have you been making cars? And who are your engineers? And well, not the tough questions. The questions were basically, well, Liz, we're behind you, and where can I send my money? News of Carmichael and her car soon spread across the country. Liz was being interviewed by Newsweek and People magazine. But back at Carmichael's headquarters, authorities began to question her claims. I'd like to see Liz Carmichael. Okay, That's Liz. right. I'll check with RD. The California Department of Corporations accused her of illegally selling both dealer franchises and cars that did not yet exist. I have a desist and refrain order issued against 20th Century Motor Car Corporation. Then, the Department of Motor Vehicles discovered that the company had no state permit to manufacture cars. We went to the research and development lab and observed what appeared to be people appearing to be busy, but in wandering through the lab, uh, I saw no evidence that they were designing a vehicle or in the process of making a vehicle. Everyone in the research and development lab, without a doubt, was sincere, believed in the car, and there was even talk if the company should fold. There was a group of us that wanted to get together and continue with the car. We believed that much in the car. The Department of Motor Vehicles sent investigator Bill Hall to check out the three hangars where Carmichael claimed the cars would be manufactured. I went to this airport. Upon entering, I discovered the factory were nothing. Hangars were absolutely empty, no tools, no machinery, nothing but a little dirt on the floor. They had rented this for only one month, and the rent had now expired. So they actually did not have a factory that they were representing they had. With the authorities closing in, Carmichael decided that it was time to move her headquarters to Dallas. But two and a half weeks later in Dallas, the DA filed criminal grand theft charges against Liz Carmichael. Back in California, Bill Hall went to the research and development lab with a search warrant. Upon inspection of this vehicle, it was not a viable vehicle at all. It had no engine. Two by fours were holding up the rear wheel. The accelerator was just sitting on the floor. It wasn't even attached. The windows were not safety glass. They would bend back and forth. The uh, doors were put on by regular door hinges like one might find on a house door. The vehicle just absolutely did not exist. Mr. Carmichael? The Dallas police, police also searched Carmichael's house. Apparently, she and her five children had moved out in a hurry. But Carmichael left behind evidence that she was not who she seemed to be. God. What do you got there? It's like some kind of padded girdle. This is Carmichael. I don't know. Okay. Liz Carmichael was gone. But nine weeks later, she was found living in Miami with her five children. A neighbor recognized her from a news photo and called the police. She was working for a dating service and was going by the name of Susan Raines. They also learned that Liz Carmichael had another identity. Liz Carmichael was really a man. Jerry Dean Michael. It turned out that Michael was already wanted by federal authorities for counterfeiting and jumping bail. So was his female identity a disguise? Michael claimed to be in preparation for a sex change operation. But even without it, Jerry Dean Michael had everyone fooled. We had no doubt that this was a woman. You just didn't question it. You just didn't question it. I never thought that Liz was a man. I always thought that, and she is today, she is still Liz to me, still a female. Miss Carmichael, we have a warrant for your arrest. Jerry Dean Michael, alias Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael, was arrested on April 12, 1975. He was extradited to Los Angeles and put on trial for conspiracy, grand theft, and fraud. 
Liz arrived in court every day in mini skirts. Now here is somebody who's over 200 pounds and over six feet tall, has a uh, demeanor of, I am a new Henry Ford. It was uh, rather bizarre. Liz did not give one quarter in the course of the trial. There was never once when Liz gave up her position that the people who supported her would vindicate her. This car is the car of the future, sir. The idea was valid. It was sound. It could be done today. It could still go back in production and still be a great car. There's no doubt about it. If she were to walk in this room and say, let's go again, I'd go right with her. Has the jury reached its verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. We find a defendant guilty. Michael was released on $50,000 bail and appealed his conviction for the next four years. He lost every time. But when it came time for sentencing, Jerry Dean Michael was nowhere to be found. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, we received a tip from a viewer who recognized Jerry Dean Michael as a flower vendor named Catherine Elizabeth Johnson. Michael had chosen to live in the small community of Dale, Texas, and was arrested at his home. Michael was returned to California. There, he was sentenced to 32 months on several counts arising from his auto scam. He was sent to an all-male facility. After serving just over two years, Jerry Dean Michael was discharged with three years of parole. A prototype of the Dale is in the permanent collection of the Peterson Automobile Museum in Los Angeles. Next, a man facing execution for murder tries to frame his own son for the crime. Greenville, South Carolina. The night before Thanksgiving, a grocery store full of holiday shoppers has become a target. How's it look? We're gonna do this one, let's go. I can't believe you brought the kid. Don't worry about Rich. He'll carry his weight. The thieves are career criminals. First inside is Rusty Corvette, a convicted drug dealer. The mastermind is Sam Watke, an armed robber out on parole. Waiting nervously in the car is Watke's 19-year-old son, Richard. I don't write this in here right now, forget. Is your video section still open? I've got to get a tape. I turned around, and that's when I saw a man wearing a ski mask and holding a gun. Wait a minute. You're not going anywhere. Everybody at the floor, do it! Face down, now! I was close enough to see the color of his eyes, and I thought, he doesn't care that I can recognize him. That was the scariest thing of all, because I thought, if, if he doesn't care, what's going to happen here? Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Move to the back of the store. Go, go, go! Move! Very cool, all the way back to the store. All the way back! I said back! What do you think we're cutting? Get a pleasure. The take is almost $8,000, but the robbers do not make a clean getaway. Two store employees catch the make and license plate number of the car. Behind a gray cutlass, it just turned off a of Rutherford Road on the 291. There are at least two subjects in the car. I advised the other cars that were around me. A roadblock is what we were trying to do, and you know, be able to stop him, get him out of the car, and arrest him without hopefully any uh, instance of injury. Within minutes, other units converge on the robbers. Charlie 29, uh, I'm heading north on Piney Mountain. Officer Dennis Eubanks and a volunteer constable, Valden Keith, move in from the opposite direction. Head right to us. Eubanks and Keith swing around and get ahead of the chase. He's coming in right behind you. But before they can set up the roadblock, the robbers are bearing down on them. Sam, let's run! Sam, let's hit him! Get around him! 
Backup arrives too late. 46-year-old Falvin Keith, a father of four, is dead. However, within 48 hours, police have arrested all three suspects. If convicted of the killing, Sam Watke would face the death penalty. While in jail, he talked Rusty Corvette into helping him with an incredibly cold-blooded scheme. Watke's plan was to identify Richard, his own son, as the trigger man. I wrote it all down for you. Everything you need to say. Here, take it. Come on. We're gonna make Rich look like one geared up cowboy. It was like it was a game to him. He acted like this ultimate story he was gonna tell was the truth in the matter. You know, I mean, he, he was plotting to, to put his own son in the electric chair is what he was doing. Watke continued to insist that he was innocent. Sam, what do you think of it so far? Fantastic. Yeah? So, truly believe in the judicial system and it's really impressed me a lot the way things are going. In the end, he was convicted of murder, primarily because his son and Rusty Corvette testified against Sam Watke. Watke, however, had created just enough doubt with the jury to get a life sentence instead of the death penalty. We were leaving the courthouse and he grinned at me and, and he said, you know, he said, life isn't nothing. He said, you know, I'm going to get out. Uh, he was very confident about it. It took almost eight years and several botched escape attempts, but Watke eventually made good on his threat. One weekend, he and another inmate, Danny Lale, were assigned to an unsupervised landscaping detail on the prison grounds. It was a Saturday, so there would be no midday headcount. Let's do it. The convicts used the stolen hacksaw blade with a homemade handle to gain access to an underground maintenance tunnel. Watke and Lale had to slice through three wire gates and a steel door and the rebar sandwiched between two wire mesh gates. It was 22 hard cuts in all, and there were only eight hours left before the evening head count. I imagine the adrenaline was pumping, nervous. Every sound they hear, they figure there's going to be a guard coming to get them. By 4.30, Watke and Lale had made it to the boiler room. keys to that truck am I gonna have to get them myself I told you not to come down here doing my ship Watke what am I supposed the trustees to who were working there didn't want to get caught helping them escape 15 minutes. but they weren't about to get in their way get some rope so we can hog tie ourselves with barely 15 minutes left Watke and Lale drove a prison truck out the main gate and disappeared police caught up with Lale less than a month later Watke, however, had disappeared. Sam Watke is in a category by himself. He is, I believe, very psychopathic. Face down now! It's not that he enjoys killing, but he'll do it in an instant. He will do anything it takes to preserve him, and he won't hesitate. Update. Immediately after this story aired, one of our viewers in Colorado reported that a former co-worker looked exactly like Watke. She gave authorities the man's name and birth date. A database search got a hit in Louisiana. Authorities there provided a copy of his driver's license. Without a doubt, it was Sam Watke. He was using the alias Michael Allman, and the address on his driver's license led police straight to his door. Watke still faced a life sentence. He was sent back to prison, and that's where he eventually died of a heart attack. Rusty Corvette served 11 years of his 21-year sentence before he was released. Corvette was later killed in a shootout with police after a botched robbery attempt. Next, Bill Beatty loved his magnificent mansion so much that he may not have left when he died. Many claim they've seen his ghost.
Basking Ridge, New Jersey. In 1923, a wealthy executive named Bill Beatty and his wife started building a 17th century style Norman castle on 150 acres of woodland. Yeah, everything's coming along just fine. We've completed work on the kitchen and the basement. How far up we're gonna go? We're gonna go up another foot, okay? And you're gonna have five, you're gonna have 11 by five. In 1930, before construction was complete, the Beatys moved into the castle with their four children. But Bill would never see the completion of his dream. Just one year later, he died of the flu at the age of 45. His castle wasn't finished for another five years. Sarah Beatty never remarried. She raised all four children in the castle and lived there until 1941. Then the castle served as a boys' school for several decades. And finally, Don and Carol Burlingame bought the estate and began to remodel. Carol was really the first one to feel some sort of present. And she had a friend that was sort of an amateur parapsychologist. And she said, well, there definitely is a presence here. And Carol said, well, maybe we should try to get rid of him. Shouldn't we have a, a seance? And, and, uh, and she said, no, you better leave things exactly the way they are. He's friendly, he's happy, uh, let it go at that. After Don and Carol moved in, hammering noises echoed through the hallways, and footsteps were heard going up and down the stairs. Don and Carol started to accept that they shared their home with the ghost of Bill Beatty. One time, Bill demonstrated just how much he really cared about the castle. We decided we were gonna go off for a little ride, and Carol had all the windows open in the servant's wing where we were living. And Don said, you better close all the windows, it's supposed to rain. I said, no, it's not gonna rain, don't worry about it, I'm leaving them all open. So I left them open, we went out, and it rained. We came home and all of the casement windows, which open from the inside and open to the inside, were all closed and latched. Oh, what did it get? It didn't. There's no water on the floor. There wasn't a drop of rain in the house. So our only conclusion was, Bill helped us out when he saw the rain coming. He closed all the windows and gave us a hand. Bill Beatty's ghost also seemed to have a sense of humor. Or maybe he just liked different TV shows than Don and Carol. Huh. I don't know. Let me see if I can fix it. You just get into a movie, just the really interesting part, and all of a sudden the station would change. It would go from two to three to four to five, and it happened more than one time. Turning back. And even. I knew that there was a presence here, but what I couldn't figure out was when was he going to leave? If in fact was he ever going to leave? Um, I, I just. It was something I couldn't figure out. The Berlin Games began to look into the history of the castle and found Eugene Melville, who used to work there. I said to him what I see in there, and they said they sensed something themselves, but they never seen him. But I only seen him that once. I can truthfully say that was the only time I ever laid eyes on him, was that once. You seem to be under here, Mr. B. Three years after Bill Beatty's death, Eugene was helping Sarah search for a bracelet that she had lost. It's Bill, my husband. But it was a figure of a man standing there. No, Bill. It didn't stay long before me to examine it very good. It was just going just like that. It was scary. I don't know about this. It frightened the daylights out of me. I just never wanted to go in that balcony again. I passed by it, but to get me in there, to stand there, oh, forget it. I wouldn't go in there. Apparently, Bill had something of a throwing arm. I was alone in the kitchen. The bread was on the counter. There was no way that it could have fallen off by itself. And when it did fall off, or fly off, it, it went a considerable distance, so I know that someone had to have moved it. There was no one else there with me at all, no animals, Don wasn't around. There was no way the bread could have fallen off the counter because it was set square. Okay, Bill, that's enough. Knock it off. And that led me to believe that 
Bill had to be there saying, hi, I'm here. There was just no way that that bread could have fallen off the counter by itself. Don and Carol invited Dr. Michaeline Mayer, a noted parapsychologist, to visit the castle. Mayer and her assistant conducted a series of tests for paranormal activity. Our physical instruments were not able to detect anything unusual, but in this particular case, the sheer volume of the reports adds to the credibility of the case. One of our witnesses in this case, um, a particularly credible witness, in fact, a professional person of some stature, reported seeing uh, in the driveway in front of the castle a person who dissipated right in front of his eyes. Can I help you? Who are you? I think the big news here is that humans can act as sensors, and we find that we cannot uh, dismiss this evidence as caused by coincidence. Stair treads are going up on that second floor. OK, come on. The key to existing with a ghost is if you can accept it, you can enjoy it. And when things happen, you just write them off as, oh, it must be the ghost, or it must be Bill, if you know who it, happen to know who it is. I firmly believe he will never leave the castle. Uh, the love of the thing maybe got the better of, of his soul. And I think that's the thing got such power, you know, is the soul. It's eternal. Next, Prospector Dan Willens left behind a huge fortune, but no will. Then, an arsonist torches almost 30 churches in 16 months. Red Lake, Ontario, Canada. On a previous broadcast, we told you the story of Dan Willens. In 1926, Dan found gold while panning at Red Lake. He and his partner staked out their claim and established one of the most profitable small gold mines in Canadian history. In 1936, Dan set out into the wilderness and was never seen again. He left behind an estate that today would be worth as much as three and a half million dollars. It has remained unclaimed for more than 70 years. Update. Within days of our broadcast, Davey Willens contacted us, claiming that he might be one of the heirs to Dan Willens' fortune. My grandfather came from the UK to Ontario in 1895. We believe he traveled with another family member. And we also have been told that there was a cousin someplace up in the outback of Ontario. So when this Unsolved Mysteries program aired and this Dan Willens, a bushman from Ontario, was, was disclosed, it certainly was an exciting possible link for our family tree searching. Davy Willens flew to Toronto, Canada to meet Joe Perkin, one of Dan's last surviving friends. Davy brought along photographs of his grandfather, Harold Willens, and his great-grandfather, John Willens, to see if there was a family resemblance. It was uncanny, I, I couldn't believe it. The similarity of the face, the nose, the spacing of the eyes, the forehead. I think if you took the beard off the old man, uh, they'd look like twins. There does seem to be a strong resemblance. Could Davy Willens be an heir to Dan Willens' fortune? Now Davy plans to look for some of Dan Willen's old belongings. He thinks that they might contain traces of DNA that could prove a family connection. If you have any information about the case of Dan Willen's and his fortune, please log on to unsolved.com. Ocala, Florida. Firefighters rush to the First Baptist Church. Despite their efforts, the 85-year-old landmark is completely gutted. The damage is in excess of $4 million. Incredibly, this is the 21st suspicious fire in Florida during a 16-month period. Authorities fear that they might be dealing with 
a serial arsonist. The first fire was set in Jackson County, Florida. Within a year, 15 other churches had been torched. The fires mysteriously stopped for three and a half months. Then, destruction erupted again. In seven days, seven more churches went up in flames. Authorities formed a special joint task force made up of federal, state, and local investigators. The task force is looking at all possible patterns and avenues, everything from profiles of possible fire setters to times of day and other information regarding the churches. But there certainly is no specific pattern that has been determined at this point. Churches like ours like to stay open and offer people a place to meditate or pray and, and be involved 24 hours a day. And it's got to the place now to where we can't leave our doors open uh, so someone could come in and pray. Uh, you know, we're having to guard the church. I would hope that we will come to some sort of quick solution. However, I think it should be noted that we need to be prepared for the long haul. These are very complex investigations. Close to 30 churches were damaged or destroyed by the arson fires. It is sheer luck that no one has been killed or seriously injured. Still, the combined property losses totaled more than $8 million. And money is not the only measure of the destruction. These are very important places for us, very important structures. They house memories, good feelings, and they're a very vital part of our community. So the loss is heavy for all of us. Update. Patrick Lee Frank, a 41-year-old drifter from Tennessee, was charged in connection with the church fires. Frank was found not guilty by reason of insanity and he was sent to a federal psychiatric facility for treatment.